And as Peter um, discussed, we did have a retreat a few months ago. And we just to discuss priorities. And I can see that there's many future areas of exploration and uh, opportunity. We live, unfortunately, in a land of a finite budget. And so the only way we can push that budget out is by doing bloody brilliant science, in my view. And so what I hope that we will do across the spectrum of HAO is exactly that. And by doing that, and in, and in realizing that over the coming years, we will have to take some fairly um, well-measured choices. You know, it's, it was very interesting to hear Bob McQueen talk about the times that impacted HAO in the 70s. You know, I hope we're not at that door, but when we live in a limited sandbox, there's only limited things we can do without doing significant reconfigurations or significant uh, maneuvering of funds. And so I'll try to get to what those challenges are towards the end of my talk. And so I'll try to go quickly through this, because I know everyone's tired. I know I certainly am. Um, the title of the talk, of course, is HEO Forward, Building Capabilities and Enabling the Community. And so I see that very much that interactions with the community both on the federal and on the civilian and in the university communities is very critical to HEO's future moving forward. As is understanding the great big ball at the center of the solar system. How the magnetic fields in that thing are generated. How they erupt. Then, how the pitcher lobs the ball and how the catcher receives that ball on the other end. Does the, does the catcher get knocked over? Does the catcher get blown out of, the, out of the ballpark himself? It's very important to understand the various degrees of impact that the sun has on the Earth system, on the solar system, and how that impacts us as a civilization. And so when I gave my presentation at the Fisk Planetarium on Monday night, I put this slide up. The HAO studies the processes that drive the ongoing relationship between the sun and the earth from minutes to centuries. Combining state-of-the-art observational methods and numerical simulations, HAO is working to improve forecasts of solar activity across scales that can have major societal impact. And of course, I also demonstrated that, and as John demonstrated also last night, that the range of solar activity and, and the public's perception goes from raw natural beauty, just the aurora, through vulnerabilities and power goods that we've heard a lot about this week, to vulnerabilities in space infrastructure, all the way to vulnerabilities in the financial system. So I think, actually, our science is extremely relevant now, and maybe more so than it was before, if we can effectively communicate that with decision makers and with the general public. So, I, where's Sarah? Helio Geospace. Yeah, right, right on. <laughs> what is the Helio Geospace community? It's a weird combination configuration of solar, terrestrial, and heliospheric scientists. Um, I guess Dick could probably testify in great detail about how wonderfully those three groups work together, or not. And so we have to come up with concepts that meet that goal, right? I think uh, what happens in light times of limited budget is that there's a schism, a fraction, and things start to fall apart that the communities don't work too well together. Um, and unfortunately, as HEO is designed currently, uh, as I inherited it, we live at the nexus of those three. But we really don't have any heliospheric capability. We understand the two ends of the system, but we've got no transit in between. And so that's where our connection to Swipsy comes in. 
and to the university community, like uh, Ilya's uh, colleagues at Michigan and other groups at BU who actually do the transit of post-eruption to Earth, Dartmouth. And so we don't have that capability in-house, but it's a capability that we can achieve by partnering with our community. As you know, although I'm surprised I haven't seen this, maybe that's partly my fault, HA is one of seven NCAR labs. The Climate and Global Dynamics lab up on the Mesa, the Atmospheric Chemistry Observation and Modeling, the Computer uh, and Information Systems lab, EOL, the Earth Observing Lab, M cubed, the Mesoscale and Multiscale Meteorology Lab, and the Research Applica Applications Lab. And of course, we are the most important, so I give us the biggest logo. Oh, we are also the oldest. Aha. And so, one of the critical things that in our future is establishing very, very strong links with these other laboratories because we are a crucial component of the sonar system. You know, I think you don't have to look too deeply into the NCAR strategic plan to notice how important the sun is to that system. Here's our present organizational structure, and I won't linger on this too long because I don't want to take too long. We have a very effective administration team. We have a wonderful instrumentation group. We celebrated their devices and gizmos all week. We have three scientific sections at this point, and those three scientific sections actually resemble the kind of discombobulation of the field, if you like. There's upper atmospheric science, and there's solar science. We talk about depletions in solar science, but additions in atmospheric science. We're all HAO people. But as we move forward, as I said, we want to build, and I don't know if I should associate a gender with this. <laughs> we want to build strong, permanent ties to our sister labs within NCAR. We want to build strong, permanent, and multi-way ties to the national and international communities to help exploit things like DCAST, bring in the international expertise, help them develop techniques to understand the very, very complex polar metric signals from both DCAST and COSMO, etc. And I think a lot of those activities are underway. And it's very encouraging to see. I think we need to build capabilities that challenge our scientific understanding and help those two groups reach their own goals because I think it's from beneficial reaching of goals that we all achieve and succeed and ultimately get dollars. And again, back to Jim's slide with Walt. I think it's crucially important that those scientific activities are relevant to the taxpayer and our stakeholders. And I would challenge you all to think about how better to communicate your science to your fellow taxpayers stakeholders. And it's the first time the word stakeholders has been used this week, I'm sure. But we have to think about people like Elia. We have to give Elia tools, research brilliance to take up the stairs at the NSF and say, these people are doing fantastic work. We must support them. As Peter said, we had a retreat. And our retreat took place in May. I thought it was very, very positive. We got together as small groups and developed strategic goals. And those goals have been collected. And while you know, this activity has really taken over things in the last month or so, we have spun up a writing group. But that writing group will be spun up even further in the coming weeks. The, to the point where I hope that a draft plan will be put together, something in the order of 10 or 15 pages, and delivered to um, our external advisory committee for uh, deliberation before it goes to Jim's office and to the NSF, and then out to the public, you know, out to the community for comment. Because I think it's very important to get their feedback on whether or not we think we're doing the right things with the dollars they wisely, or, uh, or they generously invest in us. As part of that process, 
we came up with two grand challenges. And those two grand challenges largely mimic the two grand challenges that, that, that dominate NCAR's plan. And grand challenge one is pretty much space weather. Improve understanding and forecast of space weather hazards and impacts on Earth, people, and society. Challenge two, improve understanding and projection of solar contributions to geospace and atmospheric system variability on regional and global scales. And that speaks much more to the climatology of the geospace environment and how the sun evolves over decades, centuries, and millennia. These are all things we can do. But we need to commit to a path forward. This morning we heard Sarah talking about Cosmo. Cosmo is going to be phenomenal if we ever get the dollars to build it. We need to build and ram home the science case for Cosmo. Complexity in the magnetic fields, nonlinearities in uh, the connections between the photosphere, chromosphere, and corona are all critically important. They drive space weather. They work at one end of the system. One of the other amazing uh, and novel things about Chromag in particular is this ability probably to see flux emergence on the global scale. And so one of the things about CSAC and Cosmo working hand in hand will be this integrated capability to try and get ahead and model the 3D, as Sarah called it, magnetothermal environment of the inner heliosphere. That model of the inner heliosphere is something that, in principle, through uh, data assimilation techniques or however we're going to do it, we're going to have to engineer the living daylights out of this thing. But that inner magneto magnetothermal model of the inner heliosphere is vital to Tom Berger and his daily activities. Is that really the progenitor of how we're going to drive the next generation of space weather models? I believe Terry Onsager hit on that yesterday afternoon, that HAO should be investing as a national center in assimilative technologies to figure out how to take these observations that we have and build them into space weather models. We're one of the only places in the world that has that expertise in-house, that expertise lives within NCAR. And we can learn to adapt those technologies and move them forward. And then Han Lee also talked about WACOMX and the building the capability to understand the bottom up and bottom up and top down variability in the TI system and what that means for space weather. Now, space weather and space climate, critical things that are important to a lot of the business sector. And so there's potential funding avenues in the business sector should we make the correct connections. And I think in my one criticism of HEO in the past is it's been too insular. We need to actively go out and cultivate relationships with industry, governments, universities, because funds are scarce. We can't do everything in-house, but we can build very strong partnerships to accomplish the grand challenges that we set on the last slide. But then there's a mutual benefit. What do they get from us in return? Oh, let us go off and drink coffee and scratch our chins for four months doesn't really work very well anymore. As much as thought and planning are critically important, so is delivering. Because I, I'm a strong believer in track records. If you show um, politicians, etc., that you can deliver on the promises that you make, chances are they'll come back to you with more. And so one of the things we're thinking about is how we're going to move forward. And clearly the science, I think the science should dictate how we structure ourselves. And it's not in stovepipes. HEO is really working at the interfaces of the system, both the inner in terms of the sun and at Earth. And so a lot of the activities we do have to be solar scientists working hand in hand with atmospheric scientists. And so one of the things I think we will do shortly is move or reconfigure ourselves into two themes. Instead of having three sections, we'll focus more on space weather and space climate, the short and long-term evolution of our entire system. The goal being to 
embody this fact that we are a community and we're not isolating ourselves as solar scientists and terrestrial scientists. We're one. Of course, underneath that, we have core capabilities. HEO has always had a strong history in spectral polarimetry. They have a very strong history in chronography and cutting edge measurements, synoptic measurements. And so what we have underneath, that's of course in addition to WACMX and the proud history of Ray Robles' work in the upper atmosphere that we've heard a lot about this week. You have three key groups and then a big old sandbox. And in this big old sandbox lives data assimilation. In this big old sandbox lives understanding the spectral irradiance of our star so that we can better inform colleagues in the Global Climate Dynamics Division about the inputs to their models. It's always baffled me, why do they have to go outside of NCAR to get the inputs of their models? Does anyone want to answer that question? No. But that is imperative to us to address because it does build those strong connections to our sister labs. Now, I think in here, there will be a lot of wiggle room, a lot of room for innovation. This is the place where delivering on these three things buys you the wiggle room to think big. Let's go for it. What's going on in here? Peter. What's the next generation model for the solar interior? Let's put it in here. Let's do it. Let's to get together as a group to understand the origins and eruption of the solar magnetic field. Let's pull in members of our community. Let's come to consensus on what that is and bloody well do it. Excuse my French. We're building capabilities now that are really going to help push these goals forward. And um, we should just become the temple of Rempel. Matthias is pretty phenomenal. And so as soon after I took charge, I talked to him and I said, how, how, and I know he'd been thinking about this, how can we push those incredible simulations up? Because by pushing them up, we can build critical capabilities in the understanding of solar magnetism the signatures of it in the outer atmosphere that we really need to help Valentin with DKIST, but also ourselves with Chromag, with COMP. And so Matthias has taken this charge and he's been helped a lot by Phil. We extend the model to the outer atmosphere and you get, and I won't try and describe what these models are, but there's a, a mocked up one million degree uh, plasma from this pair of spots and in a 5 million degree plasma so it's capable. We're building national capability here because right now the only models like this exist outside of the US. So it's also critical for NASA missions like IRIS. Forthcoming missions that uh, maybe on the pipe like Solar Sea need this capability as much as the ground based telescopes do. You need the ability to understand the photons that you're measuring. We saw this slide earlier too. I think Jim showed part of this. And hopefully it plays. From the eruptive phase of magnetic fields through um, spectral polarimetric capabilities and the feedback between the observation and modeling can we help improve the lead time on CME travels to Earth? By characterizing the solar wind structure that the CME is going to propagate into, that's probably going to help. We heard Tom mention the Wang Shili RG model, WSA model. Um, I'll give that the big thumbs down. Let's do better. We have the observations with COMP. We'll have the observations with UCOMP. Let's try and understand where the fast wind comes from. Let's try and understand where the slow wind comes from and put them together in a global model that can then help and inform the next generation space weather models. 
Only HEO has the capability to do that. And beyond that, I think with the work of Yu Hong, as it's illustrated here, and her um, cadre of postdocs and grad students over the last few years, we're making significant inroads into the structure of CMEs and the triggering processes for those CMEs. And so again, building capability. Hanley's amazing simulation, you've seen it multiple times this week, of ionospheric disturbances that are being generated by the troposphere. The bottom up aspect. And of course, you know, in times of Carrington scale events, maybe you don't need all that tropospheric complexity, but it's bloody sure good to have it at all times. I think one of the things we're working on is this concept of seamless prediction that's been developed in the meteorological community where it's not, and as you heard Congressman Perlmutter say, it's not about weather and climate. You develop the one model that does it all. It's a challenge. Who said it's going to be easy? But I think if you can talk, again, this boils down to talking the right language with the right people. If we can demonstrate success in the short term and talk about and demonstrate our capabilities, then maybe these people will invest in us and we don't have to worry so much about uh, the fiscal environment that we live in. And of course, one of the great opportunities with Wacom X, and it certainly this resonates very strongly at the governmental levels and also in the research community, is the ability to ingest data to nudge the models using measurements from both the cosmic suite that we have now in-house, but golden icon that are coming up. We're actually going to be able to enhance the capabilities of these new missions because with the models, you'll have an interpretative guide. Think about it. Point measurements, but you now have the glue to join the point measurements together in terms of physical variables. Cool. Join the dots. We all played, who played join the dots when you were a kid? Everybody did, right? That's what we're doing. But we're doing it with physics. And so when I talked a little bit, and, and, and this is a, a beautiful example. Wacom X, Wacom. Both the radiative and the ionospheric inputs are connection pieces between us, CGD, ACOM, and Sizzle. The data assimilation pieces connect us to RAL and M cubed. So in principle, we're really taking steps in integrating ourselves very strongly within the NCAR family. And I'm going to do my utmost to ensure that continues. But what comes after Wacomex? Coupled whole geospace model. We have Tom talking about a geospace model. I think it would be pretty cool. We heard Lara talking about small sat capabilities. Wouldn't it be awesome if someday someone put a constellation of CubeSats out as remote sensors out there? Again, remember the last slide. We ingest that data. We build all the point measurements and build a comprehensive picture of the variability in climatology of our own atmosphere. Now, Michael will say, brilliant, because that maybe helps inform the astronomical community on what you may want to see or what you may want to look for in exoplanets, in exoplanet atmospheres. And so anything we learn here is directly applicable to many, many fields. I think CubeSats are a real revolutionary way to go in small sat capabilities. And this is a very, very busy slide. I'm not going to talk through it all, but there is something that we've just realized that solar flares and CMEs are not distinctly unpredictable events. They ride on weather systems. Those weather systems are perturbed fairly significantly over fairly prevalent timescales. 
the processes of flux emergence on the sun are being governed by something that's truly global and not erratic. Something is producing order out of the chaos. And so it's imperative not only to model that order in the chaos, but also, I think, to observe it. And the only way I can think of doing this, and this is when you hear the analogies about um, space weather being where terrestrial weather forecasting was 60 years ago. We were limited by our single viewpoint. With terrestrial meteorology, they were limited by their, only their local time. It took being able to get away from that local time to understand the full picture and be able to prognosticate on what was coming down the pipe. I think with stereo, the stereo mission, we get a fantastic look at things coming down the pipe in terms of space weather. But I think we need to go the next step. And I think that next step, I kind of dubbed it the solar meteorology mission, involves small scat technologies, distributed engineering technology uh, and infrastructure, give the universities things to build, magnetometers, HO can build compact chronographs on small sats. We heard from Lara that these buses are being developed right now. It's maybe not so far-fetched. Let's take the Christmas tree, shake it. All the ornaments fall to the ground, pick them up and scatter them in space. Doable? I don't know, but I think it enables an entire community if you do it. Building capability and communication pathways. We've heard about this eclipse. Doug Duncan gave a wonderful um, talk about the 2017 eclipse that's going to pass over the entire continental US. And Elia told us about Eclipse 17, this brand new uh, field project between um, HAO, Smithsonian, NRL, and uh, Torino in Italy. Uh, sorry, and the University of Wyoming. I'm starting to get tired. It's going to be a fantastic way of exploring a point across this massive path of totality. But there are upwards of 100 million people in that path of totality. What better way to go out and reach out to them and educate them about how the sun interacts with the earth at all times? We've got two years to spin up. So remember what Doug Duncan said, be an advocate. But it's not just a one-time deal. If you didn't know, in 2024, long before our 100th anniversary, there's another total solar eclipse, interestingly enough, the two cross in Carbondale, Illinois. But this thing goes right through Mexico City. I guess they'll be doing some atmospheric absorption measurements in Mexico City when this thing goes through. But the 2017 eclipse is only one, the first opportunity. We've got a second one. And so what I see here is this ability to go out and really reach out to the general public and then try and engage them in what we do so that we don't have to scramble for dollars. It's great when nature throws you a nice little soft curveball to whack out the park, isn't it? And so let's go back to my slide. That Eclipse 17 and the ability for it to fly on the G5 connects us also with ACOM and EOL. So we're starting to build all these connective pieces. Shep, uh, Paul Shepson showed this slide the other day. HEO has got a phenomenal visitors program. Every single one of us almost in this room has been a beneficiary of that visitors program. Everyone pretty much over the entire week has been a, a beneficiary of that program. I'm very, very proud of it. We'll support it. It might. I will support it to the hilt. I think what it does is it brings in a lot of diversity of thought, gender, and other things that are crucial to HEO moving forward. And so to conclude, and I'm sorry that it's been it's been a long week. Here are the things that I think we'll do. And these are all open to some level of debate, of course. 
We'll continue to explore the origins and the instabilities of solar magnetism. In fact, I would charge my staff with coming up with something big. Let's do what's not being done in the community, but let's enable the community. Let's work hand in hand with them to push forward. We'll continue to develop COSMO and push for next generation observations to improve our space weather forecast skill, but we'll be doing a ton of fundamental science in the process. Develop mechanisms to understand the magnetic signals from our star throughout the atmosphere. How does that atmosphere couple? What are the pathways through which mass and energy fly through the sun's outer atmosphere? I don't talk about coronal heating. Don't talk about solar wind acceleration. They're two sides of the same coin. But how does that mass and energy flow are critical things that determine the spectral irradiance of our star. The movement of photons dictates the UV and uh, UV photon passage through the outer atmosphere. We'll continue to develop WACMX. And in parallel with developing WACMX, we'll develop assimilative strategies to get even more out of the data and feedback into the observing and forecast systems that are critical for um, a whole bunch of things. I think also Mosumi, is she here? Hi, Mosumi. Has been a pioneer in the area of data assimilation for solar physics. And she's my representative in NCAR's data assimilation panel. And I think in the coming years, we'll be leaning very heavily on NCAR expertise to get, um, to develop data assimilative strategies that will help Tom Berger, that will inform the next generation of space weather models and maybe even sculpt them. And so that is going to be a huge challenge. But I think it's one that HEO can rise to. I think the very important thing here is to seek partnerships, to integrate our science and skills and capabilities with those of others. I see HEO as a crucial partner in the DKIST development. I see HEO as a crucial partner in SWIPSI's future development. And so the three of us Valentin, Tom and I need to work very strongly together to make sure that not only that message is being sent internally, but also that that message is being carried to Washington and abroad, that, um, that in partnership we can accomplish great things. And finally, we will continue to engage the public and advocate for our community. We will strengthen that community. I'm very hopeful that we can bring our community through the doors through a series of workshops and strategic initiatives, and hopefully through our strategic working groups, the big sandbox. Bring the community in. The interface is two-way. We benefit, they benefit. I think it's very important that uh, our community is um, fully engaged in HAO and invested in HAO and NCAR in general. And so with that, I'll go back to my thank you slide. It's been a long week. You've all done wonderfully well. There's actually no nodding in the room. I want to thank you for coming, for taking the time out of your crazy schedules to sit here and listen especially to me drone on about things. The UCAR President's Office supplies some uh, generous funding, as did the NCAR Director's Office. Thank you, Jim. HEO staffs put a tremendous amount of work into this activity and I applaud them. Also, the members of the Boulder Solar Alliance, I'd like to thank Tom and John, Sue and Lara for, for coming here and talking to us. I thought it was very interesting to hear Congressman Perlmutter's perception of where science is and what he thinks we should be doing. The UCAR comms team, archival team, multimedia services, and HEO CSMT, Ron and Kim have been sitting here all week making sure that everyone's good. Thank you. Where's Ron, Bo? Thanks, guys. <laughs> and then, of course, the UCAR events team for putting on a wonderful spread. And as it failed on uh, Tuesday and everyone remained faceless, we have faces now. Because I thank Joan. 
Cheryl, Andy, Greg, Tito, Don, Wendy, Greg, Card, Rebecca, Joanne, Alice, Doug, and Bob McQueen for the tremendous effort they put in to making this possible. I applaud them all, and I hope you join me in thanking them very much. Thank you, guys. And with that, I'm done. And I'll open it up to questions. If anyone has the stamina. Yeah, Scott, uh, not so much a question, but a, a comment. Your second slide where you showed all the, the, the in-car labs and the affinities arrows um, in two areas. But there's a third area, and that involved the missing arrow or affinity to EOL. And I think it's really, really important that um, the observatory recognize the value of the design and fabrication services and the machine shop. Because if it weren't for them, our instrumentation projects would not succeed. And we need them in our future for the success of VISP and UCOMP and, and, the, and the instrumentation in the future. Absolutely. And, I'd, and I got to, um, I forgot to say this on my talk on Monday, but uh, deep gratitude and thank you to all the service that they have provided um, to our instrumentation efforts in the past. I think EOL does exactly that. They do a lot of unheralded background work that does enable most, all, almost all of our instrumentation efforts. So thanks for pointing that out. Scott, I actually have a question. Um, I'm kind of a oh Discovery Channel and you know History Channel kind of buff. Love watching those things like uh, how the universe works and things like that. And I remember here a few years ago, uh, one of our prominent scientists. I was talking to him about you know really I, what I what I find is sort of a lack of of a prominence of HAO in any of these things. I see former uh, uh, scientist uh, Holly Gilbert on there. I see uh, Craig DeForest from Southwest Research. Uh, but I don't really see us, and we're kind of one, I think, one of the preeminent places that's doing solar research. And maybe our, our images aren't as sexy as SDO and some of those other things, but uh, I think we really do do a lot of that. But I don't really see us promoting ourselves. And the scientist said, when I mentioned that to him, he said, well, we just kind of keep to ourselves and do the science and keep quiet. And I think that that's a mistake if that really is what we do. You know, we're doing a lot with with new types of media and things like this these days. But one thing I think that gets HAO out there is that name as it's going on down the screen of credits. Thank you, HAO, for these images. And, and our scientists who are you know, very articulate and, and able to, to you know, take the information out to the people, I feel it's something that we're really bypassing. I wholeheartedly agree with you. It blows my mind sometimes that they go to certain places for pieces of information, particularly newspapers and time. And um, no, I, I think, um, and I think what you saw this week is maybe a slight culture change. Yeah, it, yeah. Um, the communications crew are really starting to do a, a good job of getting us out there. And I think that's important that all of the staff need to really think about engaging, yeah. not just, you know, is any opportunity that comes up, get out there and talk. I think uh, there was a, a very significant ripple of applause that went through the audience at the planetarium because those names were splashed up. Yeah. So we need to do that. that yeah, I'm, that was refreshing. I'm with you, Ron. I'm yeah. with you. I don't know if anybody else plans on saying a thank you to Scott, but I personally would like to extend a great gratitude to him. He, 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 he's someone that cares so deeply about this institution, as I do. We don't always agree on things, as you can tell, but um, that devotion and his hard work, I mean, I don't know how many hours of sleep he's got this week or anything like that, but um, I hope I'm not stepping in, in on somebody else's toes by, by suggesting that we really do appreciate what a leader we have here and, and that you know, his devotion and uh, keenness for the institution in which he was brought up in is something I can relate to personally very, very strongly. 
and I think we'll all be better off for it. So if we could thank Scott for his incredible hard work, that would be great. And with that, I don't know if this is going to play. I'll put my microphone really close. Someone pointed this out to me a while ago. It was actually John Feynman. Um, does anyone know what this is? I'm going to play it. This magnet is really a miniature model of all things. The earth, sun, trees, cells. Everything is shaped by magnetic fields. I was, of course, going to follow that up with a clip from Jerry Maguire, Show Me the Money. But anyway, thank you very much for coming. Um, it's been a real pleasure to host you all. Thank you. <laughs>